one of the most important things that made them feel seen and made this program worth their extra time in internship was pay. One model that we've adopted is the next generation collaborating, which is what I described by the healthcare folks getting together and saying, here's what the region needs. Some of our neighboring towns in the same county start to become rural and or even frontier, which really means per square mile, there's not very many people. Pie in the sky dream I'm super excited about is I would love to start a PTSD focused clinic here in Central Oregon. Hi everybody, this is Rachel and Elise from Cornerstone Whole Healthcare Organization, and you're listening to the Life Support Podcast, the show that covers everything healthcare, from behavioral health to substance use recovery and much more. Today we're talking to Adam Dickey from the Central Oregon Behavioral Health Consortium about some novel strategies they've developed to address behavioral health workforce shortages in the central part of the state. We also talked to Adam about pie, specifically pie in the sky. So thanks for joining us and enjoy. It's so great to have you here. Can we first start off with a little bit of an introduction? And here at CHU, that's your name, your pronouns, where you're dialing in from today, what you do when you're not working, and then finally, what you do when you are working. Adam Dickey, and I use he, him pronouns. And I am from Bend, Oregon. That's where I'm calling in from today, uh, which is also my hometown. I was born and raised here, left for school and came back about three years ago, and I'm really excited to be back in my hometown. Things I do for fun, uh, I'm an avid DIYer, though if you ask my partner, I never finish my projects. Uh, I fin eventually I finish them, but you know, it takes some nudging. I also love to downhill ski. My yard is my hobby. I do finish all things in the yard, and um, I love just being in the outdoors and, and living here in Central Oregon. I'm also a dog dad, did I ever say that? Huge, huge love of my uh, rough coated colleague Lincoln. In work, I am the director of the Central Oregon Behavioral Health Consortium, which is an Oregon Health Authority grant sponsored program here in Central Oregon, which is intended to train and retain our local behavioral health workforce. We also receive some funds from our local health council, the Central Oregon Health Council. Well, can you tell me a little bit more about that? I mean, the dog sounds great, but definitely also want to talk about the, the work that you do and really the primary aims of the network, maybe a little bit of backstory on how, why it was formed. Absolutely. You know, the backstory is really interesting. Here in Oregon, we have workforce boards and there are nine of them and they work to, to support the economic and, and workforce needs of regions throughout the whole state. And ours are nine counties in the Central Oregon region, ranging from the gorge all the way up at the top of Oregon, all the way down to the border of California. And my job focuses specifically on the three counties in Central Oregon, that's Deschutes, Jefferson, and Crook. And within the Workforce Board, which is East Cascade Works here in Central Oregon, the health community got together through their partnerships through the, the Workforce Board to say, how do we develop our workforce in healthcare and how do we really support healthcare the best as possible? And they decided to, to really focus on mental health and the needs in our region that are mental health needs. So those mental health professionals carved out time to meet together and made a plan. And the plan that they made was to go after Healthy Oregon Workforce Training Opportunity Dollars from OHA, also called How To. And they secured in late 2019 a million dollars from OHA through the How To program to start this behavioral health consortium. Modeled much after what would be an APA accredited psychology consortium, such as the consortium in Hawaii or the consortium there in Idaho. I believe there's a, a consortium there and a couple of others across the state but focusing on our region's students, which are primarily master's clinicians, masters of social work out of Portland State and masters of counseling out of OSU. And so we were born in 2020 and took, I took the helm to start to develop the program that is what we offer today to these local students. 
Thank you for that. I think that kind of kind of grounds us and anyone that's not as familiar with kind of the makeup of the state. Can you tell us a little bit more about your region in particular and maybe dive into a little bit more about your students? You said master's level students. Just kind of tell us about that. Yeah. So our region in particular and the state also in, in general has a lot of rural and frontier spaces. And we use similar definitions such as other national definitions of what is considered rural or what is considered like an urban metro area based on population. And Central Oregon is particularly unique because while Bend and Redmond, which are the kind of center of the counties, have a larger population, just right outside of that, some of our neighboring towns in the same county start to become rural and or even touch into frontier, which really means per square mile, there's not very many people. And also per closest destination for services, the services can be limited. And therefore, when it comes to, to the, the behavioral health access, in general, that number starts to look like less than one therapist per 1,000 people. So the access is extremely low. But if you get into like that urban center, like Bend, where I live, it's closer to one and a half therapists per 1,000 people. So Oregon kind of decides some things are better, some things are a little worse, and some things are a desperate need. And that's one of the things that it makes our area unique, especially once you get past the Cascades. The Cascade Mountain Range really dictates services uh, on the east western side of the Cascades, like Portland, Salem, and Eugene, services to access and uh, resources are a little bit different once you come over here and the disbursement of people is much greater. I think that that's interesting when you talk about the timeline and then all to your communities. It seems like your consortium, your network was maybe a little bit ahead of the curve in some ways. I mean, it seems like we've re we really reached this point where all across the country through 2021, 2022, people were saying, gosh, there's a crisis in terms of providers and training people to the top of their license and recruiting, particularly to rural areas. It seems like you all are working on a problem that everyone has, but maybe have been thinking about solutions just a little bit longer and then developing some of those solutions. So can you talk a little bit about your strategy and um, what what we could maybe beg, borrow and steal from a group like yours? Absolutely. You know, I, I, I would love to think that we are ahead of the curve. And, you know, I, I think in some ways we are. I, I think in many ways we're running into the same concerns that other regions already know about. And, and maybe we've got a little bit more intimate with that problem. Like, okay, how can we solve it? And running into some of the same problems that many regions are and trying to be novel in, in, in addressing them. And I think that it, in particular, what, what we have done that makes our program unique has been because we're next to this workforce model, really where East Cascade Workforce Investment Board, which really powers the consortium here with their financial management, and then they're the 501c3 that really allows us to go after our state and any kind of funds that require that type of business status. We, we have adopted many of their models that support our programming. One model that we've adopted is the next generation uh, collaborating, which is what I described by the healthcare folks getting together and saying, here's what the region needs. That next generation model of saying, you tell us what we need, not from the state level, not from a top down, but a, from a, a very lateral position of you're in the workforce and you know what our region needs more intimately than we do. And then let's put money where that can impact. So that's one thing is really gathering information from the community that you're going to serve. I think next is really applying an apprenticeship model in a space that hasn't typically been applied. Internship for a master's level student is typically not paid. Internship for a psychologist, which is defined differently, it's a whole year of work that's at a generally APA accredited internship site, which could be across the, the country. I moved from Oregon to Vermont to do mine, typically is paid. And, and the time frame is different. 
but there's a lot of free work that mental health people do. And I and we here at the consortium believe that that starts the burnout process of doing this work long term. We, we almost intentionally start to burn our new workforce out by not giving them credit for the work they're doing by paying them. And so we've applied apprenticeship model, which says during your learning, which we are providing, and you will re be paid for that learning time. So that's another thing that we've done. And, and in our, our research uh, of the first cohort, we learned one of the most important things that made them feel seen and made this program worth their extra time in internship was paying. So there are a couple of things that I think have actually helped people connect better to the community and their sites. I love it. Pay, pay people and they will show up and stay. But I think that that's amazing when you think about some of these strategies. Like, I, I suppose I didn't ask that question to say, yes, we found the genie in the bottle and we can manifest clinicians into rural areas. But there are some strategies that sounds like you not only think work, but no work and you're implementing them. Sure. So that's fantastic. And we're prioritizing a higher stipend payment if you're going to be in an internship site or you're doing your associates and part of the consortium, we're paying a larger stipend for being in that space and learning to take care of the population that lives in their community, right? Instead of them having to journey to Bend where there are the more, more therapists per person, they can stay in their community and, and actually receive services where they live. That makes so much sense. I think, so you've really talked about kind of the the incentives and the need and ways that you can kind of work to fill this gap. Can you tell us a little bit more though about what specifically maybe practitioners are missing when they, you know, you mentioned Portland State, someone's in Portland, they're doing a lot of work, but then they, they want to move to a community that's smaller than 2000. Let's do an extreme example. What kind of things are they going to learn through these apprenticeships? And do they learn just kind of being in the community, even didactics that they might not get otherwise? Right. You know, we're lucky, you know, while well, Portland State, which is is in, you know, downtown Portland, our largest college, I believe, in the state of Oregon, we actually do have Portland State Cascade Campus, which works out of our, our uh, another one of our education partners, Central Oregon Community College. So we do actually get to see our, our learners here. They are in our county, which is excellent. And it's so wonderful to know that they are really still going to continue to invest after 20 years growing this program in Central Oregon. And similarly, OSU out there in the, the Valley area, they also have a local campus here. They're, they're our first true university. They have built their own campus and they're really growing a lot of programs. And I think when it comes to that unique thing that they need to learn as they're working in through their, their training program and into their internship and then soon becoming a board certified associate working towards licensure, that the unique components of a rural setting can, they're broad. It can be you are going to be living in your community and you may see your clientele at social gatherings, at, at events on a more regular basis than when the number starts to get larger as a community, a community size. So just being able to talk about that as a, an encounter and a, a, like a duality of relationship uh, an impact on how services are delivered. That's one thing that that's, this is small and it can then be bigger, which is for example, there are people who need to receive the same services in our central space where there are more people like Bend and Redmond, like LGBTQ folks that live in our rural spaces and they deserve to get services that are high quality, high ethical, high diversity therapeutic experiences right there in their community. And being able to have that there in their community makes that community a safer and better place. I think too, like as you're talking, it makes me think, I know you address this all the time, I'm sure, around stigma. And I remember kind of quickly looking through your website and seeing that cultural competence really highlighted. What do you think about kind of someone living in a community, understanding their stigma and maybe seeing a mental health pr provider, but then when there's so few people really experiencing that stigma, I guess, what sure, can you Sure, and I think that? one that pops into my mind is just the stigma that's particularly interesting in our region. Bend is seen as, well, there's these bumper stickers out there, out here in Oregon that say, don't bend, 
Prineville or don't bend Lapine, literally meaning bend has gotten to be this very large and quote, liberal space in comparison to maybe what it once was like when I was a child. As a, as a gay man, I think Bend is a far better place having returned to it from when it was very small to have a lot more services and a lot more access to services and a, just a more holistic approach to being able to live here. But that doesn't mean that another town does doesn't doesn't have to become bend either to to have the right services uh, and in Deschutes County in general uh it, it's a very interesting split as you go south to our newest town in Oregon Lapine in uh the late 2000s was the last town Oregon kind of actually said you are now your own municipality it is going through a lot of growth and it has a lot of growth to do that is good for it. And then I'm sure that that community is working on how to understand what it means to take on growth and still be probably a smaller town for a long time. Um, and in that, we have a great opportunity to teach our trainees and our cohorts here through the consortium um, how to be open to all things that are also cultural. Rural folks have their own understanding of life and culture, just as urban folks do. And that is a culture. It's a culture in of itself. And what does certain aspects look like in terms of how they express their sociopolitical understanding of their world and their environment? And those are lovely conversations we get to have on a regular basis through our case consultations when folks bring in challenging questions that maybe they're learning at a different level. A typical mental health space is, is quite liberal, but you might be working with somebody who doesn't hold the same view set as you and, and worldview as you, but you've got to take care of them. And that's some really awesome, unique learning experiences we get to give them. That's just really incredible and makes me think about, like you said, a lot of the models and literature for other disciplines, like when you think about training medical providers or in psychology programs. And I think that that idea about the connection to the community, particularly in rural, is so important and probably goes the other way, too, in terms of finding the right fit for a clinician. So like training them to work with the right work with the community in the right way and respect that culture but then also figuring out like the recruitment and retention piece what is what does the network specifically focus on in terms of recruitment and retention strategies for for rural spaces well first i would i would think i would highlight that we gather quarterly to make sure that we are addressing what the region needs holistically. So we now, the consortium, take those behavioral health, medical-minded folks that started out by getting a grant, we now can kind of set the table to get together and say, what does the community need? And so then we create these four quarterly trainings based on that. What had, how can we impact the, the unique needs of our entire region the best we can with what I like to call treatment to condition therapeutic approaches? Another way to call that is evidence-based therapies, but EBTs, treatment to condition therapies. What I why I like to use the word treatment can or words treatment condition therapies is a lot of folks we come out of our masters or our doctoral programs not learning a very specific approach to taking care of X, whatever that might be. It could be uh, depression, it could be anxiety. Maybe you have one tool to teach those things, but you don't have all the other tools to maybe take care of, say, PTSD. So we have brought annually cognitive processing therapy for PTSD. We've done a gender diverse youth training. We've done motivational interviewing to really get at the co-occurring space and changing substance use in our region. We've talked about pain care and pain management and expanded on Oregon's requirement on pain care, which we annually or biannually have to take a one hour CE to keep our license, we hired those folks to create a really robust expansion on that. That is an everybody, all of those are an everybody everywhere experience. 
And we give those to these early clinicians and our licensed clinicians. We have seats for them too, to take on this learning. So I think that's one thing that we're really trying to do to tackle some of these things that we know we need in our region. Didactically, we also have quite a bit of learning as well, self-paced that people can take online over the course of the nine month training program we've developed. I think when you spell it out, it's like, yeah, that, that makes sense, but it's not something that a lot of practice communities across the country have and, you know, points to why people might want to group towards those population centers is it's like, well, I've got access to my peers. I've got access yeah. to continuing education. And like you said, some, some of those economic drivers too. And it seems like you're really creating a resource to not only serve the community at large, but also the community of providers. So I, that's so exciting. And, and I, I do think that the community relationship is, is huge uh, if you're one of our trainees, maybe doing your internship at Warm Springs Reservation or down in the South County of Deschutes County, which would be Lapine, or over in Prineville, um, it, it can be a, feel a little lonelier because you have maybe one other or two other therapists in town. And but thankfully, we have you know services that ex expand all of these regions. Our federally qualified health center, Mosaic Medical, has a really robust group of integrated primary care providers. So there is a door to knock on, thankfully, but then we expand that, that network of available clinicians to consult with and really make, I think we're really making an impact from a community standpoint, that consortium model of saying, we're going to pool our resources, we're going to pool our ideas, and then we're going to implement change collectively. And we've gone from 14 agencies as the original folks that started out writing the grant and securing the funds to now 26 agencies who have signed our memorandum of, of understanding and are engaging in this collaboration. And we've really added all those folks in about the last year and a half. That's a huge growth. First of all, congratulations. And I know yeah. that's not easy. I mean, I think that getting input also is super important. Sometimes it can be difficult too, because there's so many ideas, so many things coming in and so many different like needs and directions to go. I guess, what are you most excited about going forward? What kind of things do you have coming up the pipe? Can you give us a yeah. little preview? Well, you know, for one, one thing, we really started to expand on some additional funds that we received from Oregon Health Authority to impact supervision. A bottleneck that takes place, I think I, I would imagine nationally, but certainly in our region, we know for fact is you graduate, you've had a supervisor as an intern, which can be a person who's held their degree for two years. Maybe they aren't, they don't have to be licensed yet, or maybe they are licensed, but then there's a bottleneck of needing to take, depending on your degree type or your license type. A certain amount of CE postmasters to then be able to supervise an associate, a person who's going towards their license and now holds their degree. We get this bottleneck as people need to get a job and they're like, well, we'd love to hire this person, but we don't have enough supervisors in our space. So we went after some additional funds to specifically support supervision. And we're doing that by soliciting from our members, our 26 folks, if you have a person who wants to get their master's level certification and take the next steps to become available as a supervisor for associates, we'll pay for it. And so we're paying for that education. We're supporting whatever the state also might require based on where they are in their licensing process, how there might be some supervision of supervision needed. And then our goal is to increase the number of supervisors as as early as six months in. We kind of think that it would be about a six month process. And actually we've had success already. We had a person who hadn't taken this post master's education, took part in our first cohort that's running through it. And they have immediately added an associate to their small private practice and immediately expanded access Basically, they've added 100% more service it, at a doorway for care by adding this associate. So it's a, it's a awesome that this person was able to take that and get, get to supervising right away. That's one thing I'm excited. Pie in the sky dream I'm super excited about is 
I would love to start a PTSD focused clinic here in Central Oregon that we can really focus on the evidence based treatments of cognitive processing therapy, written exposure therapy, and other really robust care approaches that we know treats PTSD and get that set up like other places have very, very focal treatment programs. So we can start to tackle, I think, one of the things that really gets really gets in the way of people's function and daily life. We love pies in the sky. And thanks for sharing that with us because I think to kind of like that vision of where you're going helps us. I know some people listening to might be thinking like, this is really relevant to yeah. the people that we serve and these are needs that we have too. So it's just I, kind I, of I, about where you're going. I suppose I have another pie in the sky too, which is let's get the first APA accredited psychology internship over here on the eastern side of the, the central or in central Oregon, because anybody who's doing a psychology internship in the state of Oregon is over on the western side of the mountains, likely in Portland. And that just means that we're just not naturally recruiting the newest set of peoples over here in a, a whole line of service like psychology. Another point. Well, now it's official. You're, you're on I'm, the record. I'm putting out, yes, I'm putting yeah. out the call for. <laughs> We we can't manifest uh, new clinicians, but we can manifest the pipeline, right? <laughs> and next, I think that's the beauty of the consortium altogether is if I've seen anything really change in our community since not only there's many things that I've seen change, like seeing a young clinician go from having the base knowledge of their master's program to leaving our consortium and becoming that much more of a competent and competent provider, be willing to take a rural position as an example. Say like, I'm not scared of um, a population that has been underserved for so long versus, well, if I'm in a, in a more urban region, I know that there are more providers. And so I'm not, I'm not the only person holding some of the most hard cases a region has to offer. There are more people taking on that responsibility together. It's like, can you lift a piano by yourself or can you lift a piano with the whole band? You can totally do that. And that's what I think we've, from a relational standpoint, the consortium has really brought together all of the lines of service from integrated primary care behavioral health to specialty, to co-occurring, to children and family services. We're really trying to make a mark in all of these areas by focusing on what those areas have for growth edges. I am so excited to hear what y'all are doing. And again, congratulations on the work and congratulations on the vision. And I, I know this isn't the last time we'll talk to you, but mm. thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today because I I really can hear that this is making a difference in your community and can be a model for other communities as well. It's really been a pleasure being here and I love working with Sihu and thanks for having me. And that wraps up another great episode of Life Support. Thanks again to Dr. Adam Dickey for speaking with us, and thanks to you for listening. If you want to help us spread important information like this to more people, you can like and comment, and if you're watching us, share this video. And if you don't want to miss out on more episodes like this, remember to subscribe on whichever platform you're listening on. You can even leave us a comment with ideas for future topics, different things you'd like to hear next. Until next time, remember to help each other with a little life support.